Good morning. <clears throat> and happy Sunday. <clears throat> For all of us who are fond of saying, thank God it's Friday or TGIF as we mentally unwind from a stressful week at work or school, we should also celebrate the opportunity we have this Sunday morning to worship God and to connect with others who are followers of Jesus Christ. It's a day when we honor our mothers and we recognize that God's love manifests itself in many ways and that God, him, God our almighty loving God is beyond gender. At Greystone Baptist, all who seek God's grace are welcome. Whether you're connecting with us online or are here with us in person, we are honored that you have chosen to spend this time with us because your presence and participation enriches our worship experience. Whether you're a longtime church member, have been visiting for a while, or are joining us for the very first time, it is our prayer that you find peace, rest, joy, and encouragement here. For those of you visiting for the first time, we invite you to scan the QR code on the back of your bulletin with your phone to learn more about Greystone, or you can simply speak with any member of the staff or someone around you uh, following the service. For each one of us, uh, please introduce yourself to someone you don't know, and always make sure you tell someone how thankful you are that they are here. Now let us please rise together as we read responsively our call to worship. <clears throat> Come and hear what God has done. God has made the world and breathed the breath of life into us. But there's more. God is still on the scene, upholding all our life, surrounding us in loving kindness and granting us the freedom to live into all we are called to be. We live, move, and have our very being in God. Let the sound of God's praise be heard. Praise God. Praise God. Praise God. Praise God. for a few moments. Good morning. Good morning. It is so good to see all of you today. Thank you for coming to church today. 
I have a book I want to tell you about. The title of this book is, What is God Like? And this book helps us think about that. Have you ever wondered what God is like? I think that everybody in this room has wondered what God is like. And I bet you if you asked them, they would all have a different answer. And even the grown-ups would probably say, I still want to know more. I still have questions. So let's look. I, we don't have time for me to read the whole thing, but I want to show you parts of it. It says, what is God like? That's a very big question. One that people from places all around the world have wondered about since the beginning of time. And while nobody has seen all of God, because God is far too big for any of us to fully see, we can know what God is like. And then it gives us some ideas, like God is like an eagle. Or maybe God is like a shepherd, brave and good. God is like a fort, strong and secure. Or God is like a gardener, patient and nurturing. God is everywhere, swirling throughout the world, whistling across the mountain ranges, rustling through the trees, and pressing against your cheeks on a breezy day. God is like a mother, strong and safe. You can crawl up into her lap whenever you want to, and she will hold you until you fall asleep. God is, God is like a father, gentle and safe, and he will put you on top of his shoulders and give you a bird's eye view of all of creation. God is like a best friend, Faithful and true, closer to you than even your brothers or sisters. So it gives us lots of ideas. And then at the end, it says, what is God like? This is my favorite page. I cried when I read it the first time and the second. Here we go. That's a very big question, one that people from places all around the world and throughout all of time have answered in many different ways. Keep searching, keep wondering, keep learning about God. But whenever you aren't sure what God is like, think about what makes you feel safe, what makes you feel brave, and what makes you feel loved. That is what God is like. So in, your, in our sermon, you're going to hear about some other people who wondered what God was like and what some of those answers might would have been. So can you say a prayer with me that we keep learning and wondering and asking what God is like? Dear God, we have so many questions and we wonder what you are really like. You are so big and so amazing that you are like so many things and you do indeed help us feel loved and brave and safe thank you for being you help us to keep asking questions and to keep wondering and to keep searching and keep getting to know you better amen
Will you pray with me? Loving God, we gather in this space holding a lot of things, feeling a lot of emotions, carrying the weight of both burdens and joys this morning. But we also gather together with open arms to receive your grace and wisdom through worship and fellowship with you and with one another. Today, especially, we are filled with gratitude and also grief, celebration, and even a deep longing. We're grateful for the mothers and mother-like figures in our lives, those who love and care for us, those who provide for us and guide us with wisdom. But God, for some of us, today is a difficult day. Many of us also hold a lot of grief on days like today, including those of us who have lost our own mothers, those of us who are not able to be mothers or parents, those of us who have never even known our own mothers, and those of us whose relationships and families often feel broken and weighed down. But God, your love is like a mother hen who pulls in her flock closely, whose presence provides comfort and peace even when we grieve. May we rest in your loving arms. God, your love is like a strong and resilient mother, one who cares deeply and advocates fiercely for her children and loved ones. May we feel empowered by your loving spirit. God, your love is like a mother who offers wisdom and humility, compassion and grace. May we receive your guidance and offer that same grace to others. No matter where we are today, no matter what all we hold in this space, may we all experience and share your everlasting love. Amen.
Good morning. <clears throat> Please join me in prayer. Creator God, today we honor, celebrate, and pray with gratitude for mothers through whom you brought us into the world. Give mothers strength to provide for their families' needs. Give them wisdom and kindness as they teach their children. Grant them patience to deal with life's difficulties and obstinate offspring. Provide them the support of family and friends so they can meet the challenges that are too great to meet alone. And when they have no one else, be with the single mothers who need your grace and guidance. When mothers tire, grant them rest. When they feel overwhelmed, give them relief. Allow mothers to take joy in the wonders of childhood and find humor in the blunders of youth. Most of all, fill them with love so they can understand our trials, soothe our fears, calm our sorrows, instill us with confidence, and inspire us to rise to the great potentials you have gifted us in us. We remember the mothers who have miscarried and those whose hearts have been torn asunder by the loss of a child and ask you help them find peace. We remember the mothers who cannot care for their children and made the choice to allow another parent to raise them and the mothers who have had that choice made for them. We are grateful for the mothers who have adopted and loved a child. We ache for those who are desperately desire to be a mother but have been unable to conceive. We pray for those with a mother who did not show love and for those who have been hurt by their mother. We mourn with those who have lost their mother and are left with only memories. Teach us to see, forgive, and love one another with the compassion of a mother. Allow Christ's teachings to open our hearts Allow the Holy Spirit to be in our presence to guide us now. In your name we pray, amen. Today's scripture reading is Acts chapter 17, verses 22 to 31. Then Paul stood in front of the Arabicaeus and said, Athenians, I see how extremely religious you are in every way. For as I went through the city and looked carefully at the objects of your worship, I found among them an altar with the inscription, To an unknown God. What therefore you worship is unknown, this I proclaim to you. The God who made the world and everything in it, he who is Lord of heaven and earth, does not live in shrines made by human hands, nor is he served by human hands as though he needed anything, since he himself gives to all mortals life and breath and all things. From one ancestor, he made all nations to inhabit the whole earth, and he allotted the times of their existence and the boundaries of the places where they would live, so that they would search for God and perhaps grope for him and find him, though indeed he is not far from each one of us. For in him we live and move and have our being, and even as some of your own poets have said, for we too are his offspring." Since we are God's offspring, we ought not to think that the deity is like gold or silver or stone, an image formed by the art and imagination of mortals. While God has overlooked the times of human ignorance, now he commands all people everywhere to repent, because he has fixed a day on which he will have the world judged in righteousness by a man whom he has appointed, and of this he has given assurance to all by raising him from the dead." 
the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. From the moment I first read this scripture as part of the lectionary, I have been A, baffled by it, and B, taken by the phrase that we might search for God and perhaps grope for God. The image of groping for God in our search is so captivating. So today I hope that the words that the Spirit has laid upon my heart um, faithfully convey the wrestling that took place in preparation for this time of worship today. The reading this morning invites us to join the Apostle Paul on one of his famous missionary journeys. This time, Paul is in Athens, which was a first century hub for commerce and culture and philosophy. While Paul is there in Athens, he observes the Athenians, their city and their culture, and he notices how religious the people are. And from that particular observation, Paul ends up preaching one of the most significant sermons of his life. Now, as always, there are multiple layers to this text. If we were part of that first century audience, just hearing or reading the words Paul was taken to Areopagus, those words would summon within us memories of Socrates, who after daring to suggest that God could be present in all things, he was sentenced to death in that very place. You see, the Greeks were open to new ideas, but that openness only stretched so far. So when the Athenians brought Paul to the Areopagus, it wasn't most likely a nice little field trip to a hill on the side of town. No, it was more like they were staging an inquisition, a trial before the court of powerful opinion. The risk was high. Paul was preaching for his life. And of course, anyone who understands the gospel of Jesus Christ, anyone who believes in the power of God to, to change a life, even to save a life, we might also say that while Paul was preaching for his life, he was filled with concern for the Athenians. He knew the God that they had called unnamed, and he wanted to offer hope in their searching and seeking. And so while he was preaching for his life, Paul was also preaching for their lives as well. You know, maybe the two aren't so different after all. If Paul doesn't convince the Athenians that what he's saying is true, they're going to label him a heretic and they're going to sentence him to death. But if he can convince them, if he can help them see the God who made them and who loves them and who is the one they have been searching for, then Paul might not only save their lives, but his as well. Paul is preaching for their lives, but Paul is preaching for his life, and the stakes have never been higher. When I read this scripture, I have to confess that I can't help but feel the urgency of the moment. It feels like those old anxious benches, do you know what I'm talking about, in the old country revival settings, after the preacher gave the invitation, right, that front row where folks would gather after some lively, fiery preaching, waiting to pray the sinner's prayer and receive the gift of salvation. Those were called the anxious bench. That kind of revival preaching is an American phenomenon that started in the 1800s and kept on until, well, I guess you can say it still lives on, right? 
you can still find those fiery preachers. They don't tend to live in cities like this, but out in rural areas, the fiery preachers still deliver the fiery sermons, you know, hellfire and brimstone. They still draw a crowd and they still resonate with the people. And I can remember hearing a sermon or two like that. Do you? But you know, the more I read Paul's words here and I deal with my own anxiety, right, that it comes with those memories and experiences of those big tent revivals, I think that Paul might have actually gone a little easier on his crowd than some of the preachers I have heard in my life. The ones I heard in the 80s and 90s, they were well-schooled in the theology and tradition of Charles Finney, the original revivalist who insisted on the total depravity of mankind. And he worked that into every single sermon, which of course culminated in the call to conversion. It was a fear-based coercion that filled that anxious bench on the front row and kept the congregation singing all 12 verses of Just As I Am while the already saved checked their watches to see if they would make it to lunch in time. But Paul didn't take that approach with the Athenians with the tender heart of a pastor, and with the quick mind of a missionary, well-versed in making quick connections across lines of deep difference, Paul sees the Athenians and sees in them a common pursuit. And he builds his sermon upon what they share in common. I see how extremely religious you are. It's his opening line. I see how extremely religious you are in every way. For as I went through your city and looked carefully upon the objects of your worship, I found among them an altar with the inscription to an unknown God. Paul has captivated their attention with flattery. He has affirmed their quest and displayed that he sees them. He has been paying attention. What you worship, he continues, what you worship as unknown, I proclaim to you, the God who made the world and everything in it, he who is the Lord of heaven and earth, does not live in shrines made by human hands, nor is he served by human hands, as though God needed anything, since he himself gives to all mortals life and breath and all things. He continues, from one ancestor he made all the nations to inhabit the whole earth and he allotted the times for their existence and the boundaries of the places where they would live so that they would search for God and perhaps grope for him and find him. Though indeed he is not far from each of us. For in God we live and move and have our being. Drawing from the leading Jewish, pagan, and Greco-Roman philosophies of his day, Paul builds the sermon not on human flaws, though that is something we share in common. Paul does not focus on our flaws, but rather focuses on our common search for the creator God. The relentless searching and seeking after God, you see, is part of our human condition. We all long to live lives of meaning, to belong to a beloved community, to be loved just as we are. This is what Paul found in Christ, and this is what compels him to share the gospel no matter the risk. This is the tie that binds us together. Not our total depravity, not our perfect and impermeable theologies, but our most primal desire to know and to be known by God. To love and to be loved by God. You know, in many ways, I guess we could say that we have come a long way from the Pantheon. 
And maybe even we've come a long way from the revivalist preachers. That's a matter of opinion. Many of us might even say that we have already found the God that Paul proclaims to the Greeks in Athens on that day, that we have already given our lives to the God of the revivalist preachers. And so I wonder this morning as we listen to the text and ask the Holy Spirit to teach us something from it, is there anything this scripture has in store for us? In their book called The Altars Where We Worship, authors Mark Toulouse and Juan and Stacy Floyd Thomas make some stunning observations about our society and just how religious we are. Reading their book this week, I couldn't help but hear the echo of the Apostle Paul saying, I see how religious you are in every way. You see, the authors found that we as a people, as an American people, are deeply religious. Religion is important to Americans, they write in their opening lines for the book, but the religion we practice is often not the religion that we confess. The religion we practice is often not the religion we confess. According to their studies, Americans, like us, worship at many altars, altars of body, altars of business, of entertainment, of politics, of science and technology. These are the objects of our greatest affection and attention. We spend so many hours of so many days searching for value and meaning and validation in these finite arenas. And yet underneath it all, there is something more basic and more primal, more utterly human that is driving us toward all of these altars. And after a while, our endless searching at these earthly altars begins to sound again like the words of the Apostle Paul saying they would search for God and perhaps even grope for God. And I wonder, will we find God? Could it be that we are searching and groping in all the wrong places, at all the wrong altars? You know, the famous reformer Martin Luther once said that trust and faith of the heart alone make both God and idol. Whatever then our hearts cling to, he writes, and rely upon, that properly is our God. And then in 1960, the Christian ethicist H. Richard Niebuhr quoted Luther and then added his own words saying, if this is true, that the word God means the object of human faith in life's worthwhileness, it is evident that we have many gods. It is evident that we have a religion that is polytheistic. Maybe we're more like the Greeks than we thought. Maybe we are more in need of a conversion than we realized. Maybe it is time to bring back the anxious bench this morning. And maybe, Christian, it's time that we sing all 12 verses of Just As I Am as the preacher stands in the middle of the altar. Maybe it's time, not because we need more people to be scared into religion, but precisely because those of us who already claim it need to remember what it means to be a Christian in a world full of lesser and more convenient altars. Maybe then, if we could experience that kind of conversion, maybe then we could turn away from the God of the body, which tells us that only youth is beautiful and that every indicator of age or illness must be treated or hidden away. 
Maybe then we could turn ourselves away from the God of business, which insists that making money is life's ultimate and primary concern. Maybe then we could turn ourselves away from the God of entertainment, which helps us escape the difficult realities of life together and allows us to experience our hopes and dreams by living vicariously through people we will never meet. Maybe then we could turn away from the God of politics, which draws us toward community, yes, but when taken to the extreme, when politics becomes our ultimate concern, our primary identity, it only drives a wedge between us and the neighbors we are called to love. These are just some of the altars around which our lives are oriented these days. These are just a few of the convenient substitutes that offer us meaning and security, beckoning us to come and to place in them our trust, our identity, our ultimate concern. But I would dare to venture that our affinity for these lesser altars is merely a symptom of our deepest longing for God, our desire to be known and cared for during life's ups and downs. Yes, these are anxious times. And in these anxious times, we long for God to draw near, as near as the wind pressing on our cheek as the children's book so beautifully said. In these uncertain times, we long for God to draw near. When we are struggling to find God on our particular time and in our prescribed ways, we grow so weary of crying out for God's presence and for God's help. And in those moments, we lose trust. We wonder if God is listening. We wonder if God cares for us. We wonder if God cares about us. We wonder if God is even out there at all. But isn't it possible? Isn't it possible that we are just looking for God in the wrong places? Friends, if there is only one thing that you hear today, if there is just one small thing that sticks in your minds from this time of worship that you can carry with you out into the world, if there is anything at all that might help shore up your faith in God, may it be these few words from Paul's life-saving sermon. Here they are. Indeed, God is not far. Indeed, God is not far from each of us. Repeat it. Indeed, God is not far from each of us. And take it with you from this place out to the rest of your lives. Because, yes, there is a God who is bigger than all of our worries, who is more reliable than a youthful body. There is a God who is more secure than any savings account, who is more hopeful than any star athlete or TV star, who is more powerful than any president or governor or school board or any other elected official. There is a God who is not distant at all, who in is never too far, who is always closer than we think. For in this God, scripture says, we live and move and have our being. And if we believe that to be true, then our whole lives, all that we experience, all that we worry about, all that brings us joy, every moment, every hope, every dream, they all happen within God's loving embrace. So friends, let our voices join with that of Paul's as we preach with our lives and for our lives that there is a God who loves us just as we are more than we could ever know, who will see us through every time of trial and fear and pain. And this God is not unknown at all. No, this God 
is ultimately and intimately known. This God goes by the name of Emmanuel, God with us. So the next time temptation comes, the next time the doubts begin to creep in, beckoning us to worship at just one of our lesser idols, may we remember that they cannot save us. They will not satisfy our deepest longings. Only God can do that. And God's own name, Emmanuel, begs us to remember that God is never too far away. Always closer than we think, in fact. So when your hearts start to worry or wonder, searching for God in all the other places, rest assured that you don't have to search anymore because God is with us here, now, and forevermore. Amen. Friends, I promise not to change the song of response. I won't make you sing 12 verses. And I'm not here to scare you into anything. But what I am here to do is to offer the invitation which I believe the gospel offers to each and every one of us, and that is to place all of our hope, our fear, our trust in God, the God who is with us every step of the way. So if there is a decision that you have made that you would like to share with the congregation, whether a personal commitment of faith or a a, a request to join this community to let your life of faith merge together with ours at Greystone, we want to celebrate that together. Or if you just need an opportunity to come down and sit on the anxious bench (laughs) and experience a conversion where you can confess to God, just between you and God, the places where you need to turn back and stop looking for security and assurance in those lesser altars. So friends, the invitation is for all of us. Let us rise and sing the musical response.
A few things to keep in mind this week about what's going on here at Greystone. Um, first, remember that on Saturday, May 20th, we have a group going to Lumberton to do some construction work there. Um, if you are interested and have not yet signed up, um, please see Jerry Childs today, or you can see one of your ministers, and we will um, get you in touch with him. Leadership Council happens next week on May 21st. Um, and then Jill Pike has an announcement for us from the Action Fair. Good morning. My name is Jill Pike, um, and our third annual Action Fair is six months away. And I know you're thinking, why in the world is she up here six months before this thing starts? But we begin working on the Action Fair in January. So I want my main purpose is to get this on your radar so that and when everybody scatters throughout the summer, you'll sort of have this at the back of your mind of ways that you can, can plug in and become involved. Um, Action Fair, Arts and Crafts to Impact Others' Needs. It's going to take place here at Greystone on November 4th from 9.30 to 2 in the Fellowship Hall. The purpose of Action Fair is threefold. Primarily, it's a way to raise funds to support our local missions partnerships. It's also a wonderful outreach opportunity for us to be able to show and tell the surrounding community a little bit about Greystone and who we are as a family of faith. Lastly, Action Fair provides a way for our church family to get involved and to work together on a worthwhile project. Thus far, we already have 11 vendors paid uh, paid applications signed up and five of those 11 have signed up for double spaces so we only have about eight spaces left in the fellowship hall so we're in really good shape for this time of year we're very excited about that uh, so if you want to be a vendor please go ahead and mail in your application and vendor fee uh, at the action fair there will also be uh, opportunity to buy lunch we have bake sales we have a marketplace we used to call that community craft table but now we're calling it marketplace um, and the proceeds for these from these vendor fees and the bake sales and the lunch sales and the marketplace are what goes to the mission partnership this year um, the pro the recipient for our proceeds is going to be North Raleigh Ministries and we're, we're excited about that too. We've, I've already touched base with the lady there and she, she's very grateful and excited and they'll have a table here at the uh, Action Fair. There are so many ways that people can be involved in Action Fair. If you have something to make, uh, you may want to be a vendor, but if setting up a booth by yourself seems a little daunting, you can go in with a friend or if you just have one or two items, you can donate it to the marketplace. Uh, you may want to bake some items for the bake sale. You might want to help serve the lunches. You could volunteer to be a greeter for an hour at one of our parking lot entrances. Um, you can help assi assist vendors when they're unloading and, and setting up. You can help man the uh, welcome table that tells people about Greystone. And this year we're going to add a hot beverage station out in the breezeway, so we will need people to help work that too. You can also help promote the event on your social media pages when it gets closer to the time. And uh, you can pray for the success of the event. And last of all, you can come and do your Christmas shopping with us. So there are a lot of ways that you can plug into the Action Fair. And if, as we've said before, it really takes a village to make an event like this successful. And we need your help. So talk it up with your friends. Uh, vendor information is available in the church office, on the church website, or you can contact me or any of the other people in the planning group. And, and those folks are Linda Peterson, Karen Brewer, Heather Choplin, Deanna Choplin, and Walt Kennedy. In the fall, we're going to have a way for you to sign up to help. So start thinking about now how you can become involved because November the 4th is going to be here before you know it. Thank you. Friends, as you leave this time of worship, go forth with this blessing. May the Lord bless you and keep you. 
May God's presence always be alive within you, giving you the grace never to sell yourself short, grace to risk something big for something good, and grace to remember the world is now too dangerous for anything but truth and too small for anything but love. So may God take your feet and walk with them. May God take your hands and heal through them. And may God take your hearts and set them on fire. Amen.